What's up, everyone? Welcome to Player One versus the World and ahead of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty's um, 20th anniversary, which was released in November in Japan and North America. I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming on none other than Lady Luck herself, the Queen of Dead Cell, the voice actor behind Fortune, and that is Maura Gale. Maura, how are you doing? Hey, I am amazing. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, you, you've brought back all kinds of memories. Uh, people reach out to me all the time about Metal Gear. So I was really excited and I'm still excited to be able to share a little time with you. So thanks for being a fan and for the ask. I'm amazing. No, absolutely. And I, I told Mara that I understood how much of a Metal Gear Solid fan I am and then showed her my poster, obviously, in Metal Gear Solid 5, <laughs> Fun and Pain, and she, she kind of started to see it a bit more. Um, well, Mara, obviously, there's so much to talk about Metal Gear Solid 2, but before we start with that, I kind of want to talk about you because I speak to a lot of actors who just entered the industry or are a little bit into it, but you've had a long career in it. And in itself as well, you've been a writer, producer, you're a radio show, um, podcast host, there's so much about you. And what I kind of want to ask you is, did young Mara ever think she'd become an actor? And what would she think now seeing where you're at? Okay, so did young Mara ever think she wants to become an actor? Not an actor per se. I always knew that I would be in some form of entertainment. Um, as a kid, I sang, I wrote poetry, I did rap. I still rap and do poetry. Um, I loved entertaining people and my family and friends and everybody would kind of call on me to either perform at a family reunion or a, a, a yard celebration. We call them block parties here. Uh, so I didn't know it would be acting, although I did used to charge people to come in my basement. I charged them like five cents or 10 cents to see these plays that my sister and I would act out. Um, but uh, I just love storytelling. I loved bringing things to life. So that was the journey. It was just however I could tell a story, if it was writing, if it was singing, if it was dancing, if it was acting, I would do it. And then um, your second part of the question was, uh, what would I, was it what to, what I say to my younger person or how would she feel? How would she feel seeing where you're at now? I think she'd be proud because um, I stuck with it and um, I was focused. I had a laser beam focus to continue to uh, pursue what I loved doing. And I still love it. You know, acting is, is like being a, in a playground. You get to do it. I get paid for it. But I could do it all day, all night, and I would do it for free because I love it that much. And uh, and it afforded me some things. Of course, I, I ended up being able to pay for college because of acting and or rapping. So different things about it. But I think if my younger self would say, you know what, you did it, girl. You've been doing good. <laughs> no, I'm really glad to hear that. And I like the uh, rap part of um, the life you were exploring. Did you actually ever drop a single, ever drop an album? You know, I did better than a single. Get this. In high school, I did an album and it, we ended up doing all of the major television stations. We used to sell records, wax. I should have pulled that out to show you because I have the album. I purchased, I, my mom lost the copy. Don't ask me why, but my mom lost the original copy. So I had to purchase an album from the UK, by the way. And so I actually have the album that I did back in the day in 1983, and it went crazy. Like there were lines wrapped around the record stores. We toured and just signed autographs. And then I was submitted to a rap contest and won and got a chance to do a rap album with the legend Curtis Blow. And uh, that album, the money from that album actually uh, helped pave my way to go to college. So it, it paid my tuition and afforded me an opportunity to go to college. That is incredible. That's absolutely, <laughs> I, could, I could have expected a better story if I tried. Um, and with that as well, like I said, long running career. Um, what I kind of want to ask you is how, um, has there ever been a point where, you, you know, what stopped you from going into fatigue and like, you know, giving up acting? Um, and like, what keeps your work engine going? Like, what's the one thing that you think is the key to your success? Okay, so... Fatigue, you know, there's rejection and everything, right? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of no's before you get a yes in a lot of cases. But my love for storytelling, my love of the journey, not only I get to take in discovering the who, what, when, why, and where, but the journey I get to take people on, suspending their reality with these characters. Uh, and, I, and I should back up and say this. I grew up in an inner city with lots of stuff around me, drugs, gang violence, all kinds of stuff. So acting provided an escape, as did rap and writing. Um, and so the same is true now, not the trauma part, but 
the escapism and the desire to tell a story and to take people on a journey, all of those things are key to why I don't get fatigue. And I've been acting full time since 1990. I worked for CNN Headline News and retired in 1990. And haven't worked a job since. And so this pays my life. It's bought me houses in LA. It's, it is what I do. And so my joy comes when I can take somebody on a journey. And when I myself identify with this character and, you know, uncover their who, what the relationships are like with people, um, you know, what motivates them. And, and so acting jazzes me. You know, um, and so that's the reason that I haven't gotten fatigue and that, that I can stay. And then the, the thing that is also a part of the, the, the work engine and why it's, it's still going, why I never left it behind is as long as it's still fun, as long as it still brings me joy, um, even though it's work, it doesn't feel like work, feels like I'm just playing and I get paid to play. That's like the coolest, dopest job ever. <laughs> No, absolutely. And obviously, I would love to pick into more of this, but then people are going to start yelling at me. It's like, you got Mara Gale. You're not talking about Metal Gear Solid 2. So we're going to have to address the elephant in the room. Let's and talk. Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. Mara, what is the immediate feeling when I bring up that game? Metal Gear Solid 2 just brings up joy, pure joy. I should say pure joy and excitement. It was hard work, but it was fun and it was exciting. I was both drained and I was both energized, you know, and mainly just grateful, grateful um, to be a part of such a, a, a iconic franchise. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, amazing. And um, obviously, we're going back over 20 years of like, you know, when you got this job. Um, and I'm not going to try and say specifically how did the audition process go, but um, did you self-submit for this role or was this through an agent or an agency? Through an agent. Um, I, I booked it through an agency called Tisherman. And the owner of the agency at the time was a gentleman by the name of Steve Tisherman. And he truly believed in my gift. And um, Don LaFontaine actually got me connected with Steve Tishman, the late, great Don LaFontaine voiceover uh, artist. Um, and Steve just believed in me. And so he would submit me with thing, for things outside of my realm. And he was so excited when I booked it. But yeah, it was through my agent, Tishman Agency, which is now, I think, TGMD in L.A. Okay, because I was does, living in LA at the time. That does make sense. And um, obviously with this project, I'm assuming it was very heavily NDA'd at the time. Um, but, you know, what was um, what was your reaction like when you found out this was Metal Gear Solid and that there was a big following behind this franchise and it was a very <laughs> successful franchise as well? Well, let me say this. At the time, I didn't know how huge it was. My agent, when I, when I booked it, he said, kiddo, come in here. And he was like... You just booked a big deal. And I didn't know how big it was. And uh, we sat down and we started talking and, we, you know, we would, you know, online wasn't really around at the time to kind of dig into what we could find out now. Mm -hmm. But it was major. And uh, I, I didn't realize and I'm glad I didn't know how big it was. Uh, at the time, I didn't know the fandom. I didn't know the following. I didn't know that the franchise was that major. Um, but I just said, OK, he said, do what you did. They liked what you gave them. Go in there and knock them dead. And, and that was kind of, you know, what I did, some choices and history that I had uh, when they give you these things. And I believe, again, it was an, we had an NDA, but they they generally kind of give us a, a sketch of the character. I remember just seeing this this badass, you know, she was like. And I was like, I want her to have just, you know, this strong kind of voice. And and so I made some choices that were grounded in some things based on what she had went through. So I didn't know how big, but I surely did find out. And I'm still finding out. <laughs> of course, exactly. Of course. And, um, you know, like like you said, then um, you were told that how big it was, like you, how big of a role it is. But I kind of want to flip that a little bit in terms of like when I was digging through IMDb, this was your first voiceover gaming credit. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I kind of wanted to ask, did you ever think that you'd land such a career defining role so early on and especially outside of traditional films and movie uh, and, you know, movies, TVs, like because obviously that was the bigger norm at that time. Like gaming was just becoming a big thing. But like, did you ever think right. it would be in video games? And no, I can't say that I did, but I do know this. I told my voiceover agent that I wanted to um, get my feet wet in a lot of different areas because I used to develop these characters and all these, I did all these different voices. And again, I credit Steve Tisherman for believing in me to submit me for things like that. Um, so I can't say that I did, but I remember 
like I said, he was excited. And I remember, you know, once I got into, into the audio booth for the character, unlike radio commercials, because I had done time, I'd been making six figures in voiceovers, regular voiceovers, like commercial voiceovers and, and, and things like the promos, but I hadn't done a game. So when I got into the studio to, to do the game, you know, it was, it was otherworldly because you've got all these different things. You have TVs that are in front of you that you have to, you know, time, you have to be timed when you say what you say to for those, just like voiceover commercials when it's a television voiceover. But there's a difference for television voiceover. It's just me and my boys, you know, bringing the, the, the lines to life. But when you're doing um, a video game, your whole body, your entire body and mind and voice are all working in harmony. Um, because, of course, there's a difference between shooting at somebody and being shot. There's a difference between getting hit in the head and getting hit in the gut. You know, so all of those things, you know, the contractions of your muscles, the 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 intense isolation of the area that's being affected without you know, losing the sound that the audio people, you know, that the audio engineer is going to need. All of those different things have to be in harmony. And I was just grateful that I was being, I was in a position to, to be able to gain it quick or grasp it quickly and be able to do it. But you have like, you know, a split second to kind of make those things happen. Oh, absolutely. And um, I, I find that very fascinating. And especially with like the actors I speak to in like all my interviews, like they're not from a gaming background, but are you a gamer? Would you consider yourself someone who plays video games? <laughs> no, I'm not a gamer. I'm definitely not a gamer, but I have had a chance to see my characters uh, through the games because I have some friends and some family that are gamers. What, what was their reaction? They have to have like lost... <laughs> Well, uh, you know, back in the day when we when I when I first was able to watch it because they were playing the game, they're like, oh, my God, oh, my God. You know, you because, of course, you you have to be good to even get to the part that I'm in the game. So so that's always an exciting thing. But get this just two weeks ago, uh, my nephew, who's like 30, I think maybe 28, 30, he called me screaming because guess what? He was over a friend's house. They were playing at Metal Gear. and. He's like, I know that voice. I know that voice. Now, when he was young, I used to take him on auditions. He booked a couple of commercials with me, but he forgot that I did Metal Gear. And so he's playing it and he's hearing my voice and he's freaking out. So he called me screaming because at the end, when he saw Mala Gale, because, you know, I'm credited as Mala Gale on something crazy. And of course, that meant I had to send autographs to him and his friend, which was cool because, you know, it's always cool. But that that's always a, um, as you can tell from the the wide smile, it warms my heart uh, when that happens. And, and to see his reaction, of course, because he was such a low kid when I was doing the game. <laughs> No, that's absolutely incredible. Um, and I love that they, that that is still something that happens now. <laughs> um, but with Fortune, you know, you said that you get a sketch of like what the character is about. But what was your first mm-hmm. impressions when you saw what Fortune was like, that character you saw? And you're like, did it did it kind of hit home? Like, did you expect that? Good question. I'm assuming that you're talking about uh, the blonde hair, blue eyed, six foot tall, African-American character. Um, You know, because the sketch kind of uh, it was, of course, black and white, uh, black and white sketch. But um, when I looked at the the image, of course, once it was fully given to me, uh, it was just that's going to be a great character to portray um um, when I received the breakdown for the audition you know and though it's been a minute you know uh, and and I realized what she was going to look like all I knew is I wanted to bring her to life I it wouldn't have mattered to me if she was green two foot two and 2,000 pounds I just wanted to bring her to life uh, because she had a lot that she wanted to convey. I just thought her reason and her choices uh, for her actions needed to be um, portrayed. I needed to tell that story. So yeah, she didn't, you know, it didn't throw me off. It was just like, mm-hmm, this is going to be fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And with that as well, one of my favorite things with her, aside from the voice acting, of course, and the actual character design is um, her theme, the saxophone. You hear it played. Woo! <laughs> were you what were you about to say i'm sorry i got too no, excited no, no. about it what were you about to say that, that was the reaction i was expecting leo what's what was the feeling like when you heard that theme that when she enters and that saxophone the cool 
that okay I'm, I, I used to sing jazz all the time. So imagine my surprise with. I mean, it still is. It was and it still is one of my most favorite parts of the game and how I came, my character came to be those notes told Fortune's story perfectly. They were the soundtrack to Fortune's life. Um, it's an eerily lonely, kind of somber, sad, yet suspenseful, sex, sexy saxophone sound. And it moved me then, and it still moves me now. Oh, it still moves me now. If you if you only want to get a validation of it, go on YouTube, look at the comments, and people all quote fortune quotes, and it, it just it just shows you like everyone knows that theme. Um, That's crazy. It, no, it's absolutely amazing. And like, we'll move into fortune a bit more, and with this role as well. Um, if I'm correct to um, if I'm correct with my research of, and knowledge of Metal Gear Solid, you would have worked with Chris Zimmerman on this project. Was the voice voice director uh, mm -hmm. long standing? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, what was your experience like working with her in the booth? Um, let's see. Well, one of it was that she was very uh, focused. She knew exactly what she wanted and, uh, and, and she knew how to get out of you what she needed. And so my experience was that she truly, absolutely, positively knows her stuff. And she more importantly knows how to motivate you into giving her what she needs. So stellar professional, top of her game bomb just bomb yeah oh absolutely I, I, i'd expect that as well because obviously how long she's been involved with the series and i'm really glad that you had that connection with her and she was able to bring you out a very special character and um, mm -hmm. obviously we're, we're talking many years ago but i just wanted a general um impression of like how long were you in the booth for like how how many sessions did you do do you remember you know i was i i believe if memory serves me correct i did about i want to say four to six hour days uh, and 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 they were for about two to three weeks, so it was it was a long haul. It may have been just four hours a day for three weeks, or it could have been four to six hours for two weeks. Yeah, but it was it was it was quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, that that makes sense, and that kind of works out in the timescale of things I expected. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask you is. Um, mm -hmm. Did they ask for any like specific requirements when you were acting with the voice? Did they ask you to change your normal voice or what was the kind of like feedback? Was it, was it just go and do what you submitted for or just kind of get an idea of it? Yeah, sure. Okay. So they liked what I did in my audition. Fortune, of course, isn't my natural voice. I had placed my register deeper and darker and they really liked that choice. That's, that's a part of what landed me the gig actually is that I didn't um, come in with my regular voice per se. I just I just changed the register and made it darker and they liked it. So they said, hey, do what you did and, and let's go for it. And then they would just adjust if there was something that they wanted me to kind of give them extra. But um, they liked my choice, which was awesome because that was kind of what had lodged in my mind and what I saw when I uh, read her breakdown. Yeah, because I was thinking that because obviously I've listened to your um, radio show and and then I've like listened to the get character. I was like, there's something, there's just something here that I just like. I'm oh, kind of you with. can't, you can't figure that out. There is no way you can get this character out of me. No, it's just, it's just a place that I can put her, and she will all. That place will always be fortunes. Was that so? Like when you said it as well, was that something you thought immediately when you read the spec for fortune? You're like, I'm gonna yeah, go she. Yeah, when I read her story immediately, you know, when I started doing my background in the history and the loss and all of the things, it, it was like, she's so sad. She needs to go someplace that conveys that sadness. She needs to live in that space and feel that was immediately where I gravitated towards. And so I recorded the audition in that sound. And that's where she was. That's that was her space. She walked between that register. Absolutely fascinating. I'm blown away here. You, you don't you don't understand my metal game mind is getting blown away. Um, oh, don't tell me you're blown away, my friend. There's so much more. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, my le next question is very vague because like it's what's your favorite thing about Fortune? I love so much about this character, but like what what for you is that one thing that you take when you're like one? Not one. Okay, if I had to say one, 
She demanded respect. But if I could toss in a few extra, she was tough, resilient, confident, you know, and as a female character, you know, you never felt like you had to handle her different than the other characters. She was unafraid to be bad, to be brave, to fight. Um, She fought not like uh, she fought not like a a soldier without thinking she was able, I should say, to fight without, you know, you thinking about her gender. You know what I'm saying? She was just a badass, a chick who could fight and you weren't thinking, oh, she's a female or she's a male or she's, you know, ambiguous about that. It was just, she was dope. She was tough. And, um, and she was going to get the job done. So well, she demanded respect. That's the first thing. Of course, absolutely. And I'm going to give you a tough question here. Would you add anything to fortune or would you change anything now if you had the chance? Hmm. Um, you know, I felt like, I felt like there were there was more I, I, that, that could have been developed a, a, around fortune, perhaps. Um, you know, I, I used what was given to me to bring this character to life. Um, you know, so so perhaps a little bit more um, if you guys could have been clued into a little bit more of what, why and when um, that may have given her more of a complete arc. but. You know, I, I, they're brilliant. You know, he wrote a brilliant piece and created a great character. And so, you know, I, I did with what I could with what was given and what was given was great. And back then it was so cutting edge. You know, there wasn't any, there, it wasn't like I had a bunch of examples of what she could do or, you know what I'm saying? It was so new. That was new to see a female character in that kind of a role, you know? So that that that's that's kind of it I, I loved it um and um you know it's priceless <laughs> no absolutely and I said I did kind of did that intentionally because I it's very tough with this character for me I love so much about fortune it's like what can mm. I really change with her um <laughs> but kind of like with fortune one more thing I want to ask you is like any favorite mm-hmm. scenes with fortune whether it's in the game in a cut scene or when you were in the recording booth anything that really kind of like stands out from this project 20 years later Mm, I guess the, the, you know, the, the whole shield around me, um, was, is definitely one of the favorite things that everybody was trying to kill me. So, and then, then I couldn't die. I love that aspect. Cause you know, who doesn't want to like not be able to be killed? Uh, and which brings me to one of my favorite lines in the scene is, um, you, you can't kill me, even the bird, you know, it's like that whole thing. It was like she wanted to be put out of her misery, but she couldn't be put out of her misery. Um, So all that that line conveys, you know, it conveys so much uh, to watch, you know, even my beauty. She's going to see the the bird later. You know what I mean? Just all of it. I just I could eat her up. She's uh, she's a yummy character. So, yeah, that would that would be my favorite line and, and and one of my favorite um, moments in it, of course, was like the shield around her, you know, the protective shield. Um, with MGS2, MGS2 launches and then, um, you know, 2008, uh, MGS2, the digital graphic novels released. Um, mm-hmm. Did you return to record lines for that? Or was it lines yeah. that you used? Oh, how, how was it to come back? Yeah, I actually, I returned. Uh, it was, you know, just as exciting. Again, a playground. It was, um, it was like being, it was like a, a reunion, so to speak, with the character, but it was also just like being in a in a playground, um, being able to have some fun doing doing what you love to do once again and um, and re- reviving, you know, resuscitating, if you will, um, such an iconic role. Like who who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> so it was exciting. Um, yeah. No, of course. And um, we'll move away from Metal Gear for the moment. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, post this, you had success in voice acting in different roles and one of them included Enter the Matrix. Um, was there any point in your mind that you wanted to kind of like tap more into VO and gaming, like you wanted to go straight down this path or was it just never that idea? It was just like you wanted to be an actor crossing all spectrums. You know, what ended up happening was, I think I mentioned to you, Steve Tisherman was the owner of the agency at the time and he took a lot of risk with me he introduced me to different areas and so as opportunities came up while he was there um you know there were different games that I did um you know Bat and Kate Coast uh Kato's Origins and and things like that but there were I was booked so much I should say I was booked and I was earning a lot of money doing commercials mm-hmm. um that I think 
you know, they really, <laughs> they loved that, me bringing that in, that they kind of, you know, it was, it was, our, I was make I was, I was doing well in commercial voiceovers before I came to LA. So they, they really kind of st- wanted to steer me in that direction. And the, uh, the gaming, whenever I get a chance to do it, I landed at, I'd say I may have auditioned for seven or 10 and I landed four out of the, the seven or 10, which is unbelievable odds. So to this day, though, I am actually looking at re- doing some restructuring to pursue more um, games. I love it. Okay, no, that I makes sense. I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, that makes sense. I, just, I was just curious why it was never, because I know some actors, you get into it and they kind of just want to pursue just voice acting and they go down the gaming industry. So I was quite interested. And obviously that commercial background makes a lot of sense. Um, and I touched on speak, um, Enter the Matrix for a reason. So I, I looked everywhere online and by everywhere, I looked a couple of places, but I couldn't find out who you voiced. Do you remember who you voiced in that game? Yeah, well, I actually did a couple of things. I, um... I was called in to do some of Jada Pinkett Smith's uh, fight scenes and a couple of other uh, characters in it, but I can't recall the other ones. I just know that Jada was one of them. Um, And and so that was, that was the main stuff that I was doing with some of her, most of her, a lot of her fight scenes. I did. That must be very cool, especially with how successful she is as an actor and like you're coming and getting into it. Absolutely. Totally loved it. Which, (laughs) Which Metal Gear was the reason I was even able to, to book doing that because of course learning the placement of punches versus throwing a punch and all of those things uh are what was needed exactly absolutely that's so that's so cool and i mentioned matrix as well we'll kind of move away from it for a moment because um, whilst i was snooping for your website of course um i saw that you worked with lawrence fishburne in um, under the stadium lights what was your experience like working with him <sighs> great question phenomenal if i had to say a word because he is um not only is he, of course, just an icon and uh, an A-list talent, um, but he's generous and he's a complete uh, wonder to witness working because he'll take a minute, he goes in the script and, and we were able to chat off off scene and we talked about my podcast, just all kinds of stuff. So he's cool, he's down to earth, but he's a wonder to witness do the work because he takes a minute, he looks at it. And in and whatever, if they switch it up, if they do whatever, he takes his moment and then he comes in and it's like, bam, it's like, you know, one shot Johnny kind of, you know. So I was honored to play his wife in this Amazon movie and to interact on set and discover how we would work together for our scenes. Uh, all of it was just it was truly a blessing, phenomenal blessing. No, that's incredible. And like I said, I love Morpheus. I love him in Hannibal. There's so many films I love um, yes. and TV shows I love Lawrence Fishburne in. So I had to bring up that just to ask you about <laughs> that. Well, obviously, again, while people get angry at me again, while move away from Metal Gear, we'll move back onto Metal Gear at this point. Um, because like one of the things I noticed, obviously, I was looking online, there was merchandise with your signature on it. Whilst obviously mm-hmm. that's a little bit annoying because obviously people are selling on, but you know, I it kind of gave me experience of seeing um, people had interacted with you, they'd met you, um, and you mentioned it at the beginning as well. People still kind of talk about fortune, talk about you, talk about all that. I kind of want to just ask you, what was it like having those moments where people met you, asked for autographs, um, the fandom, everything? What what was all that feeling coming to you? Like, well, how did you? How did it just? What was going through your mind at that point? Well, I could say, what was it like? Or I could say what it is like. It's still kind of crazy. Like I could be in, um, it's mind blowing Mm -hmm. Um, because I could be in a, in a Best Buy or something or whatever, you know, or, or if somebody, if I'm there and someone says, oh, you're an actress. And I go, yeah. And they go, oh, well, you know, what have I seen you in? And I'll just say something like, are you a gamer? Because it's usually, if it's a tech person and you say, are you a gamer? They're like, yeah. And um, I say, well, I was the voice of fortune. No. And next thing you know, like four or five people in Best Buy that work there are like, this is her. And so you're, it's like, you're signing there. I've signed hats. I've signed t-shirts, but I didn't know they were selling it. That's a whole nother thing. But I even, I've even had people call me up because their girlfriend or their boyfriend was a is a fan and they'll send me like merchandise to that they want for their and they're like how much do you charge I'm like I can't charge you to sign you know I mean it's it's like please it's an honor that you you follow the character and so I I've done voiceovers wishing people a happy birthday as fortune I've 
that's one of the biggest things, you know, somebody literally their Halloween costume would be fortune or they've got a, 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 a tall replication of fortune in their house, you know, and they'll send me like the, the piece of paper that goes or the piece of plaque that goes on the piece. So there's I've gotten fan mail and requests from Germany, UK, you name it, every place, Australia, uh, all over the world. So it's otherworldly because this franchise is so huge. And then it's also humbling because you're like, it's been 20 years and people still love her. Like, you know, she was done last year. And can you imagine if she was done just last year? What, what could be done with the, the character and, and, and the, the advances that animation has made. So yeah, it's uh, it's, it's mind blowing. Oh, absolutely. It'd be even bigger. I like 20 years later, the cult, cult, the is just considered a masterpiece, that game and like the cultural yeah. revelations people still talk about and what it was talking about with meme culture and all the other stuff is, it still blows my mind. Um, and we won't go too much philosophically in that because I'll probably like, make you end the call or something but um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, representation and it's like you know we see an industry keeps evolving films tv gaming but you know if someone says to me like in the 2000s like you know name a black character I really couldn't mention one except for fortune that's the only one that really springs to my mind um, and especially as well that's a female black character as well and I think for me it right. sends it speaks testaments about your performance and then also the character mm. itself but I kind of wanted to ask you what did you feel like knowing that you played that character back then, 2000, not even nowhere near as much as we're kind of slowly getting more representation and then playing a, a black character for me personally, I'm speaking this way. Mm -hmm. I don't think she embodies a lot of um, stereotypes of like black women. She's like a non stereotypical black one. What, what's your kind of yep. take on this? That is an excellent question and even more excellent observation. Um, she, she, as you said, there, there weren't the story, the stereotypes in the characters for being black, but there weren't even stereotypes for being a woman outside of, you know, lines that somebody shooting at me would say, you know, like they can't believe she's not dying or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, she was just a good character that was st a strong character. Um, but at the time, I will say this, I felt a little bit of responsibility, you know, like there was a little bit of weight, like. I knew it was major enough that I, sh I, I don't want to blow it. You know, I didn't want to blow it. And, um, and, and before I understood how big the franchise was, I felt proud to be able to step into such a role right out the gate. Um, and I'd say even more proud that 20 years later, she's not only remembered, but she's celebrated and admired and, and, um, and that you, my friend would, you know, want to take some time to actually get to know the process behind the process and the, the artist behind the crafting of the character. So yeah, it's, it's, it's humbling. No, and that's why I kind of want to talk to you because like I would consider your character a trailblazer in video games. And I, I don't think it gets enough respect as it is. Do you feel sometimes think that you're a trailblazer for this? Would you? And um, I will, based on the fact that, as you said, I, 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 you know, and I talk to people and they say, you know, there's just aren't a lot of black, you know, strong characters in, in, the, in the games. And so, yeah, I believe so. But, you know, you don't, you don't know that to be the case. And we're looking back 20 years and we still don't have it. You know, yeah. it's still not highly represented, you know. So you have to go, wow, I didn't realize that it was making history um, at the time. But that, of course, goes to the vision of Hyjo and, and the team and how they they saw an opportunity to introduce someone that could be um, a beacon. Yeah, of, of course as well. And I, I personally think, you know, these this character would be even bigger now as well if it was introduced. Like this is the kind of the thing that the industry screams for, for me personally as well, when I look at characters like her. And I know Kojima's been very good at writing characters on the boss in the third game. Um, so like, personally, I, I completely um, respect that. Um, so I'm going to kind of be a bit more controversial here. And I'm going to say, hypothetically speaking, Mara, um, I'm the casting director of the new MGS2 remake, if it happens. Oh. So Metal Gear Solid 2 is remade. And I'm like, I come up to you and I'm like, Mara, um, I need your advice on casting someone for Fortune. I'm not going to let you take the role this time because you've set the benchmark. You are that role. Like, you know, I said, Mara, who would you cast if you had the chance now for Fortune if they had to remake Metal Gear Solid 2? Man, I don't know. I am not going to even pretend. And I'll say this. There's a lot of actresses that I could totally go, oh, her, 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 her. But... 
you know, there's some voice over talent that I'm not even privy to that, you know, I wouldn't even be able to rattle off their names um, that are killing the game, you know, just straight slaying. And I would hate to omit someone who was perfect for her trying to choose someone who I've heard and said, ooh, they would be perfect for her. So I'm going to humbly decline your generous hypothetical offer and, and leave that to the pros because they do a research in terms of ability to do that voice as well as being, uh, being able to have the stamina that it takes to be in the studio to keep that character consistent and to ensure she's able to bring everything she needs to bring to the table. So that was my politically correct way. <laughs> I'm trying to say, uh-uh, I'm not touching that. I respect I respect the politically correct answer, but I will warn you now, I did preempt that. So I'm going to flip this a little bit. So this game, Hyperfect Speaking, would be very NDA'd as well if they remade MDS2, Hyperfect Speaking. But I kind of want to ask you, say if there was a new actor coming through and as a young black actor, would you prefer them... Mm-hmm. They probably wouldn't know it, but if, say, if they clocked on that as MGS2, would you prefer them to go in blindfolded, create their own vision and fortune, or look at your character, take a bit of inspiration, see what you did? What would kind of be your perspective in that? You know, whenever you have to remake something that's iconic, mm-hmm. that that people have already had an opportunity to witness, it's impossible or extremely difficult to replicate or duplicate People need to, as an artist, bring their creativity to the table and they need to form and develop what they interpret the character as wanting, uh, who they are, what their relationship to the other characters are. And so it would be a killjoy or a, um, you know, putting out their creative light, I think, to say, okay, go in and spit what I spit. I want I want them to totally envelop it and, and make her, you know, anew and see what their depths and darkness and sadness and pain and emotions are. So I'd say give them uh, free will to play like I did because I didn't have a blueprint. I was able to play and discover and uncover and reveal. And that's the journey that I believe everybody wants to go on when they're gaming. They're playing this game with their thumbs and their hands and the joysticks and all of this to be taken and exported to someplace. Mm -hmm. So my job is to make sure I keep them on that journey and don't let them think about they're in this, the room or the space they're in. They're in this game with me. No, I I agree with you as well. And I only ask that because I've gone into another series of video games where a lot of the actors were replaced because of the SAG strike. Um, and then they new actors came in and played their characters. And I've always found very, mm. very similar similarities being drawn on that. Um, so we're coming towards the end of this, Mara, and I'll yeah. move away from Metal Gear Solid 2. But like I said <laughs> at the beginning, so much in a career that you've done. Um, still very young, of course, as well, um, just to protect myself from this next question. Um, but I kind of want to ask you, what what's the one thing that you haven't done in your career? What, what, what would be the one thing you'd want to do before you hung up your hat and be like, right, I'm done? Like, was it a specific role, a specific actor, director? Like, you know, what, what stands out in your mind? Mm, there you go with the one thing again it's so much okay uh i'd i'd love if god would send me like some star wars anything in a star wars or uh kind of vein or any kind of sci-fi fantasy um i dig that otherworldly kind of mysterious mystic kind of happening thing Mm -hmm. so if I could close my eyes, blink, or do like I dream of genie back in the day. It would be something like that. Um, um, a, a huge like Star Wars or sci-fi fantasy um, a project, voicing and or acting. Just to show you that I can read the future, I am wearing a Star Wars top as well, which is a coincidentally you said that. So, I, so oh, stop it. So literally feeding the message. You. <laughs> There it is. So it shall be. I'm going to look forward to the day. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. And Jim, before we finish, Mara, I'm going to let you plug in. Where can people find you if they want to follow your radio show? Like, what, what's the best way of people following you if they want to, if they're MGS fans and they want to keep up with what you're doing? Okay. So I have a YouTube channel, Mara Gale. And um, I also have a website, maragale.com. That's M A U R A G A L E.com. So YouTube or my website. And on my website, you can get my IG, which is, of course, Mara Gale, or my Facebook. But YouTube and my website would be the place. And my radio show, 
um, is at uptomeradio.com, which is also available on my website, but it's up the number two, meradio.com on Thursdays. It's also Spotify and all the other stations, you know, Apple Music and iHeart, every place you listen to your podcast, you can check out my podcast. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. And I think that's the end of this. Um, guys, I hope you enjoyed watching this. Please leave a comment, a subscribe, like. It really enjoys. Mara, thank you so much. I cannot tell you how great it was to revisit MGS2 with you and talk to you and have this interview. Um, absolutely happy. Um, guys, stay tuned. There'll be more content to come. Um, wonderful guest on today. I'll have more content to come soon. See you later. Thank you so much. <laughs>